the people that I'm <coughs> discussing here uh, used words largely as tools or weapons in their effort to explain the Mexican Revolution to their readers in the United States. So uh, occasionally, uh, some of the names that I mentioned you will recognize from Mary Kay Vaughan's previous presentation. Uh, there is a sort of an overlap there, which is good. Uh, I begin with a confrontation between the Secretary of State of the United States, Charles Evans Hughes, and the editor of The Nation magazine, Ernest Greening. Greening accused Hughes of conducting a blundering, aggressive foreign policy towards Mexico in the early 1920s. The U.S. Department of State, in defense of the Secretary of State, responded by accusing Greening of falsehoods, of carrying out or, or spreading a batch of lies. A most atrocious thing was one description of his article. Uh, I use this as an introductory point to let you know the language, the type of language that was being used on these issues. Uh, we'll discuss more about the content and the issues involved in a, in a few moments. Uh, the people who were involved in these discussions were very high level officials, presidents, secretaries of state, senators from the United States. Uh, generally speaking, they were opposed by in a debate with uh, newspaper editors, journal editors, journalists, and academics who took the other side. Uh, one of the points of this paper is to show that this argument was carried out within the political culture of the United States, that is, within the policies, the ideas, ideologies, the laws of the United States, but the protagonists, the people who were delivering their particular point of view, used as a base of operations Mexico City and some of the smaller towns and smaller provincial cities in Mexico City. Their goal was to try to explain the Mexican Revolution to the American public. Uh, however, mo uh, almost all of these writers who were writing in English for, for journals and uh, books that were published in the United States were from the United States. Uh, the group uh, of writers formed a kind of community uh, that had a certain internal cohesiveness, a certain internal unity, and I will explain that in a little bit more depth uh, later on. Uh, within the context of US political culture, one of the main issues was private property. Uh, in the United States, private property had a very high legal standing, something that evolved over the several decades, including the last part of the 19th century and into the progressive era and uh, into the 1920s. However, in Mexico, the Constitution of 1917 and its Article 27 contained provisions that granted to the government, the government of Mexico, the right to regulate or tax or even to expropriate property. And so these two conceptions of private property were diametrically opposed. And this was a particular concern to property owners in the United States who held property in Mexico, particularly people like William Randolph Hearst. We saw a picture of him. He owned a large estate in uh, Mexico. And even more energized and excited about all this were the oil companies petroleum companies that had recently begun to exploit Mexico's vast oil reserves. This included people such as uh, William F. Buckley Sr., uh, Standard Oil, the Rockefellers, uh, Edward Doheny, and also some British-owned oil companies who were relying on the United States for support of their position. Uh, the oil companies launched a, a campaign in the United States against any potential enforcement of this new article in the Mexican Constitution, Article 27. Uh, part of this was a series of hearings held by Senator Albert Fall. We also saw his picture a little earlier. Uh, the Fall Committee hearings, as they were called, uh, invited several people to testify, one of whom was Samuel Guy Inman. Now, Inman <coughs> was not sympathetic to the oil company position. He had written a book 
called Intervention in Mexico, which he argued against any kind of U.S. interference in Mexican affairs. Uh, so his testimony before this committee was seen as unfriendly. Uh, in fact, he sensed this unfriendliness. He felt that he was, as he said in a letter to some of his colleagues, I was speaking to an oil committee and not a committee of the United States Senate. Soon after his appearance, his book, Intervention in Mexico, was withdrawn from bookstores. It was suppressed. It disappeared. Inman didn't know exactly why. He never did figure out why, but he thought the oil companies had something to do with it. Fortunately, a private publisher decided to republish the book, and it was later published. Uh, Greening and The Nation magazine, which he was editor, continued to criticize interventionist tendencies in the United States into the, into the early 1920s. Uh, there was a confrontation with Secretary of State uh, Charles Evans Hughes. Uh, Greening became so fascinated by the Mexican situation that he, he and his wife and his two young sons moved to Mexico City and took up a residence there, rented a house there. And it's while he was there that Greening met uh, a roving journalist, you saw his picture a little earlier, Carlton Beals, who was already in Mexico. The two of them struck up a friendship. They essentially agreed on the Mexican Revolution. They saw something in it that uh, they thought was very important. And both of these men began to uh, study Mexico very closely, Beals as a, both of them as journalists. Uh, a third individual uh, joined the pair as Frank Tannenbaum. Uh, Tannenbaum was a, a rising academic, but for a few years he worked also as a journalist, uh, contributing articles to uh, magazines in the United States. Uh, in fact, there was a sort of a flood of publications about Mexico and the Mexican Revolution. And we begin to see a sort of a transition during the writing by Beals, Greening, Tannenbaum. Uh, they begin to depict not only a defense, a necessity to defend Mexico's sovereignty against U.S. intervention, but they also begin to see some, some intrinsic value in the domestic programs that the Mexican government's trying to pursue, things that we generally identify as the Mexican Revolution. Uh, Tannenbaum was especially interested in land reform. Uh, Beals was especially interested in labor organization, formation of labor unions. All of them were fascinated by the development of Mexican public schools. That was uh, Tannenbaum's first major article in the survey magazine was on the public school movement uh, in Mexico City. Uh, so the volume and I, I would think the uh, perceptiveness of articles in these journals begins to improve into the 1920s. Uh, attracting the attention of, uh, of uh, Herbert Crowley, who was editor of the New Republic. Uh, he visited Mexico and uh, uh, often used Carlton Beals as a source of information, as a guide. So we have a fairly large contingent of, uh, of writers from the United States in Mexico, in Mexico City, who are studying the revolution uh, firsthand. Roughly the same time, a new administration came to power in Washington. The uh, uh, Coolidge administration, the Secretary of State, was Frank Kellogg. Kellogg revived the issue of the protection of oil and landed properties. Uh, he made a statement, somewhat famous, some would say infamous, that Mexico was on trial before the world. Those were his words. And it appears that he had the uh, intention of serving as a uh, uh, judge and jury and uh, perhaps the person to execute the sentence. Uh, and there was an element of prejudgment in what he was saying. Well, Greening, Beals, Tannenbaum, Crowley began to attack the Kellogg Coolidge policies. And this became a, a, a large controversy. Controversy, Mary Kay Vaughan has already spoken about it. Uh, President Coolidge became upset about this, and in a public statement, he criticized the U.S. press, U.S. journalists, for being unfair to his government, for saying things that were exaggerated, that were not true. He wanted the press to publish material that was favorable towards his policy. Well, this statement 
brought another famous writer, columnist Walter Lippmann, into the discussion. Lippmann, who over his career is generally regarded as a conservative, Lippmann criticized Coolidge. He said, this, what you're asking for from the American press is to conform to whatever your government wants. And, and Lippmann uh, coined a term, the reptile press. He says this, this press would be worth nothing in terms of American democracy. Uh, this is not the right approach. He sided with the people that I call the revolutionary sympathizers, uh, Greening, Beals, Tannenbaum, and, uh, and Herbert Crowley. Uh, the Coolidge administration was visibly upset. What are these people doing? Who are they? Why are they writing all these negative things about our policy? Why are they praising the Mexican Revolution so much? Uh, two theories arose within the Coolidge administration, uh, <laughs> one of which these writers are in the pay of the Mexican government. They're being bribed by the Mexican government. Well, in a way, that was not an unreasonable uh, assumption because governments by this time did pay publicists, propagandists, to present their point of view in foreign countries. This has been going on for several generations. And in fact, the Mexican government had done that. They had paid Emil Dillon, Robert Hammond Murray, and the, I've seen the records in the uh, Obregón Calles papers. They did receive payment. But there is no record for Greening, Beals, Tannenbaum, Crowley, and the others. Uh, in fact, William Randolph Hearst accused Ernest Greening of taking payment, of taking a bribe from the Mexican government, and Greening sued Hearst, took him to court. Greening won the suit. Uh, Hearst had to, to publish a retraction, and he also had to pay Greening, Greening, excuse me, Greening a cash settlement. So I think this pretty much takes care of the issue as to whether these individuals are in the pay of the Mexican government. I, there is really no evidence to support that. Second accusation is, as Mary Kay Vaughan mentioned, that they were Bolsheviks, that they were communists, and this revolution in Mexico was somehow connected to the great revolution in the Soviet Union. And these were, these were people who were involved in spreading Bolshevik or communist propaganda. Well, is that, does that have any validity? Um, we have some interesting information. Well, Daniela Spencer has written a very uh, good book on this subject called The Impossible Triangle, in which she shows that the Soviet or communist movement in Mexico was very, very limited and had uh, only uh, minor influence in this period. Uh, but I also had the opportunity to look in the papers of Bertram and Ella Wolf, who were two communist organizers who went from New York to Mexico City to try to bring about communist organizations. Yes, that's what they were doing. And they associated with these people that I've been talking about. Well, were Beals, Greening, Tannenbaum, were they in any way involved in the Communist Party? Well, some years ago, I interviewed Ella Wolf, and she was very forthcoming, very nice, and by this time, she's very conservative. Um, so I, I think she gave me a valid uh, comment. She said, no, uh, none of them were. Uh, in fact, if you look at Carlton Beale's writings, he made fun of the Communist Party in Mexico. He said sometimes they exaggerated their numbers, which he said were in the single digits, um, <laughs> by, by including a cat that one of them had in an apartment as a member of the, of the party. So again, this, the idea that they were communists I don't think really holds up. So what did hold them together? Uh, Sheffield, uh, the, the extreme anti-communist, uh, Kellogg, uh, presumably Coolidge, thought there might that there was something going on there. What held these people together? And it's my argument here that what held them together was their growing belief that the Mexican Revolution was a unique movement that was actually accomplishing something for the Mexican people in the areas of land reform, labor legislation, public education. Uh, this is the content of what they wrote, and I think this is what they strongly believed. But they also formed what I call a bohemian community in Mexico City, where they worked together, uh, in a way they played together, they, they went to the same restaurants, they ate meals together, they went to, the, uh, to movies, motion pictures uh, together, 
Uh, and one of the best sources of information on this, this revolutionary group of revolutionary sympathizers uh, comes from Anita Brenner. She was a young Mexican-born uh, woman of, of uh, Jewish background who spent some time in Texas, came back to Mexico, and around the age of 18 or 19, she was hired by Ernest Greening to help him research Mexico and its heritage. And so she, that was her entry into this group. And soon she becomes not just a member of the group, but a dynamo, uh, a person who is socially very adept. She, she was just a very uh, friendly, outgoing person who served as an interlocutor between members of this group, Mexican politicians, Mexican artists and intellectuals. And she attended the party. She went to dinner with them. Uh, and fortunately, uh, she would go back, I guess, back to her apartment after the party or after the dinner and write notes about what she observed during the social activities. And she wrote these rather penetrating commentaries on Ernest.